Good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN. Before we begin, let's commemorate the one-year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd by a former Minneapolis police officer. We stand in solidarity with all those seeking racial justice and encourage the process of transforming rhetoric into concrete action. May George Fam Floyd's family find ease and peace. Tonight, I am honored to welcome you to an important conversation between Dr. Lisa Damore, Saul Arno, and Margot Cicero on the topic of teen mental health post-pandemic. Thanks for attending. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among others. We have over 125 videos of past events archived on our website and YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. And now for formal introductions. We are honored to welcome back Dr. Lisa Damore for a third time to Fanland. As mentioned, Dr. Damore is the author of two New York Times bestselling books, Untangled, Guiding Teenage Girls Through the Seven Transitions into Adulthood and Under Pressure, Confronting the Epidemic of Stress and Anxiety in Girls. She writes the monthly adolescence column for the New York Times, co-hosts the Ask Lisa podcast, appears as a regular contributor to CBS News, works in collaboration with UNICEF, and serves on the advisory board for Parents Magazine. Dr. Damore also maintains a private practice and consults and speaks internationally. Dr. Damore's conversation partners tonight are two members of the City of Chicago's Mayor's Youth Commission, a group made up of 25 high school and college students who are nominated by Chicago-based community organizations and represent neighborhoods and schools across the city. Saul Arno is the chair of the Mental Health Working Group of the Commission, a junior at the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools, and a member of the school's Health and Wellness Council. Margot Cicero is the vice chair of the Mental Health Working Group of the Commission, a junior at Whitney Young Magnet High School, the founder and captain of the varsity sailing team, treasurer of the Science Olympiad team, and a National Honor Society member. So now let's welcome Dr. Lisa Damore, Saul Arno, and Margot Cicero. What an introduction. Hi, I'm so happy to be here with you tonight. Yes, we're really excited um, to have this conversation about mental health. Um, first off, what should we refer to you as? Um, call me Lisa. As I would okay. just, it's a casual evening. We're just going to chat. So you Great. can call me Lisa. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your background to start off and how did you get into mental health and, and then writing books and then writing for the New York Times? Sure. So um, I decided to become a psychologist when I was seven years old. Um, we had a family friend who was training to be a psychologist and I spent a lot of time with her and I thought she was fascinating and her work was fascinating. And I came back to our house when I was seven and I was like, I'm going to do what Carla does. I didn't even know what it was called. And um, I never changed my mind. And now I'm 50 and Carla's 74 and we're still friends and now colleagues for a long time. So I, that's how I found my job and, and I couldn't be happier. And um, I'd written on the academic side for a long time. I'd written textbooks and other um, books for college use. And then I decided that the book I wanted to, that I wanted to be available about teenage girls did not exist. So that's how I ended up writing Untangled. And then truly for the New York Times, one day I um, saw a piece that I thought, oh, I have a thought along those lines. And I sent an essay in cold to the editor of um, what was the then parenting section. And she took it and then she just kept taking my stuff. And then um, after a little while, they're like, all right, you want a column? And I was like, I would like a column. So that's how that all happened. Actually, what? I have questions for you. I have questions for you. Um, I'll start with you, Margo, and then I'll give you Tell me about the Mayor's Youth Commission. Oh, well, the Mayor's Youth Commission, it's a, uh, this, we're in our second year. Um, and we, you know, we try to really advocate for youth voice. There's not, there hasn't been a lot of youth voice in government in the past um, at the table. And, um, you know, we, we've really been um, trying to put, you know, the, our best foot uh, forward in terms of youth focus and youth agenda and youth centered. And, and that's what um, the mental health working group is. And it's a group of uh, mayor commissioners and we're all, you know, trying to uh, put forth a youth centered mental health focus. 
And Saul, would you like to add and elaborate yeah, on more. that? Mental health working group, Saul. Yeah, we're a, we're a group of uh, uh, teens and college students, and uh, uh, like we, we elected to join the group because we're all super excited about, you know, working to make sure that we can support youth mental health across the city. It's part of the reason we're super excited about this event that's hopefully free and open, that's, uh, that's free and open to the public. And uh, yeah, the Youth Commission really just works to provide a youth voice in the mayor's administration. I love it. What a, what a fantastic initiative. Um, all right. What do you got for me? Well, I'm excited to get to the meat of the conversation. Uh, the first question we had was that I, I know that I've felt super, super burned out, like not just at the end of the year, but really just the whole year. And uh, a lot of my friends feel the same way, you know, it's like AP exams and finals and all of that coming up. Uh, it's been really, really tough. Like I find that when I have the choice between watching YouTube and like studying, YouTube is running out a lot more than I'd like it to be. So uh, what, what can we do to like stay motivated and like, you know, keep going just for these last few weeks? I know. <laughs> right? So first of all, what you are describing, I am hearing from every, not just teenager, every adult, everybody feels totally spent, totally spent. And so, like you say, we felt spent for months now. Um, and really for me, the, the um, good analogy is a marathon and you guys are in mile 25 and a half of a marathon and you are exhausted. And here are the teachers, um, they still have to ask a little bit of you, you still want to give a little bit more, but like people don't look so good in that last mile of the marathon and that's where you are now. Um, so I think the first thing that can help is just to say it, to name it, to acknowledge how exhausted you are, how universal this is. Um, I'm finding myself sometimes caring for um, teenagers, maybe especially teenage girls who kind of come confessional to me, like, I don't know what's wrong with me, my motivation's gone. And I'm like, everybody says there's nothing wrong with you. So this is normal and expectable right now. And then what I would say is there is no shame in needing extra support right now to focus. So if you need to do things like ask a parent to come sit with you and do their email quietly nearby while you do something you don't want to do and their company gives you support, ask for it. If you need to set a 25 minute timer, this is how I'm getting all my work done right now, set a 25 minute timer where you can see it and then you go get a reward of chocolate for every 25 minutes that you put in, do it. Um, if you need to plan on a good roll around on the floor with a dog um, after every 10 math problems you get done, do it. Um, all that matters is how it gets done. It does not matter if you need extra support. If there's anything actually that could come out of this pandemic for teenagers especially, is you have learned so much about how to dig deep and do work when you have no gas in the tank, those strategies will help you down the line. We all need those strategies for our work. And this year has been a master class in learning how to work when we don't want to work. Right, and, and you know, bouncing off of that now, I, I know at the beginning of the school, most of us um, were, you know, virtual, I mean, all CPS school students didn't really get back to school until April, really late spring. Um, and, you know, when we got back to school, it's it just, um, it's so, uh, it, it's felt a lot uh, more like awkward. It's so hard for, for us to like talk to each other and it's hard to really get, uh, you know, back to where we were with our friends before, uh, where everything felt so, um, smooth and it was all easy going and now it's like so choppy because we haven't seen each other in so long and then with teachers you know it's hard when you haven't seen that you know you just see them in the little square and zoom and then now you're seeing them in person so what do you think um, is the best way to kind of like address that and like how did we get back to sort of normal social interactions <laughs> um, think of it as being out of practice Social skills are like any other skill. So if you think back to before the pandemic, you practiced your social skills every single day and they never really got rusty because you were constantly practicing them. You have now not practiced those daily interaction in the hallway, in the classroom social skills for like, you went like almost a year without practicing those. That would be like you had practiced piano every day and then you took a year off. You come back to the piano, it's gonna feel different it's gonna feel uneasy. That doesn't mean you're starting at zero. It means that once you get back to it and start practicing again, it will come back. But if you just think of it that way, like you are out of practice, 
you have done this before, you will do it again. Just sit down, get going, um, start talking to people, it will come back. Are there any um, sort of like tips that you found helpful in, in socializing and having that be like an easier process of getting back into it? Well, part of the challenge, of course, is that we're all in masks when we see each other. And so, so much of how we cue um, friendly, I mean, our smiles are hidden, right? Our, like we have to like really um, work very hard to um, transmit a sense of warmth and connection. So what I would say is, really press with that. Like I actually make a point when I'm, I consult to a school, when I'm seeing girls who I haven't seen in a long time, I will smile under my mask. I will smile with my eyes. I will be like, hi. I mean, it's a little much probably, but what I want you to know is how we enter a social situation does a lot to dictate how it goes. So here's my, the bottom line advice. Try not to be weird. Right? If you're weird and awkward and looking down and unsure, you're going to make everybody else uncomfortable and they're not going to feel like they can easily approach you. Fake it till you make it. Be like, hi, it's so good to see you. I miss you. The other thing you can do, we call this name it to tame it. If you're feeling really uncomfortable, you can say to somebody, this is really hard. It feels really awkward. I haven't been around people for a while. I'm really glad to see you, but my social skills are really rusty. If you say that, you will feel better, they will feel better, you're good to go. Awesome, that's, that's some good tips. Um, you know, like online, we're gonna switch gears here. Yeah. Um, online, um, and especially like in school, in a mental health, or PE class, when we're doing like our mental health day uh, of learning, there's always like a ton of information in textbooks and online about like who to talk to and like what to do when you um, have like a mental health, when you're going through a mental health crisis, but there's not really not a lot of uh, information about, you know, when do you ask for help? How do you know when you're just having a bad day or a bad week? And how do you know when's the difference? When does it become your habit? You know, this is something that you should talk to a doctor about, or this is like a, a real mental health uh, issue that should be addressed like long term. It's a really good question. And it's, and it can be hard to know as a teenager because your feelings are really powerful. And um, one of the things that's true is that it's easy to lose perspective. So you're having a horrible day, you feel really powerfully bad, and there can be the sense of this is gonna last a really long time. Okay, so I have an answer to this question, but I actually, I'm gonna ask you, I have some, I wanna see what you think on it first. If you're worried about a friend, right? Cause so often it comes up in the context of a friend has shared that they're having a hard time. And so one of the things I'm watching teenagers have to do all the time is figure out that what is the, something that I can take you know, on as a friend and try to support them through and when do I need to get a grown up? So as you think that through, and then I'll answer the question, but this, I, I want to, this is an important thing for us to understand together. What's that line for you? How do you know when it's time to get a grown up? So oh, that is a that is a hard question indeed. Okay. I, I don't know. You know, I think about, uh, you know, like if friends like, you know, like aren't, aren't doing the same kind of, you know, stuff that they've always been interested in, you know, things like that really, you know, uh, you know, like worry me or, you know, just when people feel like off, like, you know, uh, I, like when we, with my friends, I feel like I really, you know, know who they are and I have a feel for like their vibe as people. And then when they feel a little like off or just a little different that, you know, worry me, but then it's hard to tell, you know, are they just off because it's an off day or are they off because like there's seriously something going on, you know. How about you, Marco? How would you know when it's time to get a grown up? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard because again, like Saul said, you, it's hard to tell and, and people hide it really well too. Like people can hide um, if something's like going on pretty well by, you know, you can, smile and say you're fine and you know just you know act happy for a long time um but definitely like I if they're you know acting you know different or feeling different about something that they really like enjoy or they, they or sometimes you can you sometimes there's like a off-putting comment that's thrown in there once in a while that you can kind of pick up on um that's like out of character and, and if that pops up more than like ones that you're noticing then uh, that's 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 something that 
sets off a red flag in my brain. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely hard because people can usually hide it pretty well sometimes. So. That's true. But I think you're both saying something together really important, which is like when your friend really doesn't seem like themselves. Right. And maybe if that's true for more than a couple of days, right? We all have some days that feel pretty low in the pandemic and also under normal conditions. But if it went on and on and you're like, this isn't the person I know, um, I think that's a good measure. Um, I'll give you a couple more because this is such a critical, important question, like when to worry. So the first way I want you to think about this, and I want everyone to think about this is let's get really clear on what mental health is. Because I think it's if we can define mental health, then we know when we're not seeing it. Now, the definition of mental health that we came into the pandemic with, and by we, I mean like the popular culture, was not helpful. And I'll tell you what I think that definition is. I think the definition that has sort of started to take hold in the culture was we're mentally healthy when we feel calm and relaxed, when we feel good. Okay, this is a terrible definition because all feelings are part of being human and not all of the feelings are calm, relaxed, and comfortable. So here's my definition of mental health. It's two parts. First, you're mentally healthy when you're having the right feeling at the right time. So actually, for teenagers to be pretty bummed out for the last year, probably evidence of their mental health, right? Anyone who thinks this is a really good time, like that's concerning. So to be sad when sad things are happening, to be angry when somebody's done something wrong, you know, to be um, really frustrated with technology and, and all, the, you know, all the wonders and also the frustrations that it brings us, totally appropriate. Okay, so that's the first one. But the second part of the definition is to handle that feeling effectively. So if you're sad and you reach out to a friend and you're like, I feel really low, here's what's going on, and you draw support from them and it helps you to feel better, bingo, mental health. Had the right feeling at the right time, manage the feeling effectively. If you're sad and you're holding up and pulling back from everyone or maybe getting high as a way to manage it, the sadness isn't the problem, it's how the feeling is getting managed, that's the problem. So for me, the definition really is not what the emotion is, it's how is the emotion being managed, right? If you're angry, are you like going after people or are you, approaching them in an appropriately assertive way to make things right. So that's one way to think about it. The other way I would have you think about it, especially when you're worried about a friend is, once safety is on the table, you need to get a grown up. So whether there's you know depression, certainly, but suicidality, for sure, um, any form of self-harm, any mixing with really risky behavior, um, eating disordered behavior, um, or dangerous relationships, those things, as soon as one of those is in the mix, a grown up needs to know. I was really interested by that point you made at the beginning about like, uh, uh, about, uh, or in your, like the beginning of your answer about like uh, feeling like really, really strong emotions and things like that. But I wonder like how you deal with those like in the moment, because like, you know, it's easy to hear it now and, you know, think, oh yeah, when I'm feeling really, really sad or whatever. But like, what do you do when you're like, you know, just really, really angry, like really, really sad? or something like that, like right in that moment. Yeah, because it's powerful. And, and one of the things that's true for teenagers is your, your emotions are more intense than mine. Um, that what's true about adolescence is that you feel things more powerfully. So this is really unpleasant when what you're feeling is uncomfortable. It also means you enjoy the fun stuff more than I enjoy the fun stuff. Um, that you know how it can be for a teenager like, the right candle and the right, um, you know, kind of their favorite tea or whatever, like it feels so good. Or um, my favorite thing to do as a teenager was to drive with music on. Like that for me, I mean, was just a transporting experience. And as an adult, like I like it, but it will never have the, um, the sort of salience and intense joy that it had when I was a teenager. Okay, so use your superpower. So what it means is when you're upset, you're very upset. But it also means if you know what helps you feel good, it will help a lot. So I would say, have your emergency kit ready to go. Just you know, know your strategy. So for some people, it's you know, um, some time with their pet. For some people, it's going for a run. For some people, it's a good cry. Um, for some people, it's a good cry in the shower, right? That, is, that can be a very powerfully um, emotional reset thing. 
Um, it can be music that you know helps to reset. Music and mood are, you know, they just work so well together. So it might be that you need a really upsetting song because you're just gonna have this feeling and work your way through it. Or you're upset and you need a happy song to try to counteract it. But, you know, what's cool about this is that it's very personal. You know, for some people it might be, I'm gonna go for a drive. For other people it might be like, I'm gonna go do an angry dance in my bedroom. Like it's, it's really what works for you. Um, it might even be going back and doing something you did when you were little, right? If you're very, very low and very, very sad, um, go back and watch iCarly and, and just, you know, like really like enjoy that and have that moment. Um, don't be frightened of the feeling though. Focus on how you get yourself through it and how you help yourself feel better. I want to ask, I know for myself, I go, I usually try to, I go right for my ukulele, right for my ukulele and I go play music and I do that and then I, I burn, I burn off all my anger when I run or most, most of it. Um, what do you, what do you do, Saul? What do you, and, and Lisa, what do you guys turn to? Saul, what do you do? Oh, that's hard. I don't know. I, I, music's a great one for me. Like just listening to like a, you know, really loud song when I'm angry and then like a sad song when I'm sad. That really does it for me. Or like, I like, you know, eating, eating is always good, you know, when I'm really sad, like, a, you know, some Ben and Jerry's ice cream or whatever really does it for me. Yeah. Well, and so just to rest on this, I mean, Margo, okay, the ukulele and the run, like basically there's nothing you can't handle, right? Between those two things. Like, I, mean, I don't know I should say that. <laughs> it's an example of handling the feeling effectively, right? The feeling's not the problem. You have your effective management. Um, so you said something about like, if you're angry, you listen to loud music. If you're sad, you listen to sad music. This is interesting, right? Because you might think, why would you listen to music that like matched to the bad mood? Here's what's really cool you have intuitive, and I watch teenagers do this all the time, intuitively understood that we have this rule in psychology that when it comes to painful emotions, the only way out is through. And so when you're like, I'm sad and I'm gonna put on a sad song, you're basically like, I'm gonna do this thing and I'm gonna do it now and I'm gonna do it here and I'm gonna get to the other side of it. So it's, it's a brilliant solution. Um, what do I do? I call a friend. I have a couple of friends who, when I'm very upset or very anxious, I will call them and I will talk to them. And these are people I know and trust and love and they know me. And um, so when they offer me reassurance, it, it helps because I trust them um, and I trust their judgment. Um, I go for exercise blocks a lot. And, and I do that in part to keep my baseline stress down so that when stuff happens that makes me upset, I'm not already at my limit. Um, and I think that's an important thing to do that you don't wait till you feel really bad to do things that help you feel good. Like try to do them as a general practice to keep your general mood, you know, your general stress lower. Um, but for me, it's talking to people. That, that's probably the most powerful thing, processing out loud with other people who I trust and love. Uh, that's really interesting to me. Like just those kind of like, like things that aren't like going to therapy or whatever. That's like a, a way of like taking care of yourself. But uh, like, I see a lot on like social media or whatever, like, you know, people post like a self-care Instagram graphic and then they're like, you know, take a bubble bath. And that doesn't really like resonate with me that much. But like, how do you, how do you find those kind of like good activities that work for you to help you like, like calm down when you're having like big emotions, I guess, but also just like in general, like make you feel good. Well, the way to think about it really is, I sort of re referred to this briefly, but I'm actually gonna unpack it. Stress accumulates. And, and, and one way to think about it, I almost think about it like a water level and we're the pitcher that holds it together and the stress is the water. And so if you know, you've know you got an AP exam and then you have some big competition and then you've got visitors, relatives visiting who are kind of like extra and take up a lot of energy and then your parents ask you to do this extra chore. And then you can't find your textbook. The textbook may not be the big thing, but like, since you were already at your limit, you totally overflow. You completely overflow and lose it over a textbook that you can't find. And then it turns out it was, you know, just under your bag or something. And so what you wanna always be thinking is you can't let this go up, up, up without having deliberate things that bring it down. So the kinds of deliberate things that bring it down, honestly, sleep. The less we sleep, the faster the stress just piles up. The more you sleep, it actually starts to lower this water line. And it also means that when frustrating things happen, they don't bother you as much. You know how like if you're exhausted, a small thing happens and you're like, ah, and if you're rested, you're like, that's annoying. Um, 
sleep, exercise, scheduling time with friends. I exercise walk two days a week with a dear friend, five o'clock Tuesdays, eight o'clock Saturday morning. It's in my calendar. Not every time I see her, is there something that's really bothering me? Not unusual for there to be something really bothering me. By the time the walk is over, it's gone. So I come into the walk here, I leave the walk there. But I don't schedule the walk when I'm here. The walk is on the calendar. So thinking about it in that way, like routinizing things that you find um, lower your water level is important to do. And so for some people, Saul, it will be a bubble bath, right? That they take a nightly bubble bath and that's the thing that brings it down. Saul, what's your thing? You think that's a routine thing you do that brings it down? Uh, I always like to read before I go to bed. That always like really chills me out. And, and like, are you reading stuff that just kind of like takes you away that you get lost in another world? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I am too right now. It's the only way I can fall asleep actually is oh. it, um, to my, cause days are so intense. And so I, um, I'm, I'm reading um, Hillary Mantle's Thomas Cromwell series. So I'm like me and King Henry, man, like it's us before bed and like, I can shut it down. How about you, Margo? What do you do? Yeah, I, I, I try to run uh, every morning. I used to be really good about this. Um, be, when we were in quarantine, um, and then I had to go, and then we ended up having to go to school twice, twice a week. So <laughs> it, it cuts into that like seven day, like running schedule, but I try to run every day. Try it. Yeah. And don't you feel so different at the end of a run? Yeah. You know, I, um, I kind of, I, I felt like when it, when I started the running regimen, um, in the beginning of the quarantine, um, and then a couple months after I mean, I was in a, such a better place, like mentally and, and physically. I mean, like physically too, you know, you're in better shape, you feel more confident about yourself. And then um, I like pro problems that were, you know, big problems that I thought, you know, before now turned in a little smaller when I, cause I burned off that emotion, yeah. you know, when I, when I was running. And then also I think with exercise that it made this just for me, but like with exercise, when you're out in the like nature and on the sidewalk and then the air and the wind and the trees, uh, you, you, you can kind of be alone with yourself and your thoughts and you can kind of organize your thoughts a little bit and work through what you're thinking. Uh, yep. And it can be like, uh, that's kind of how it works out. <laughs> when I do it. It's very powerful. Um, there's two, two things you're doing. On top, I mean, you described it all so gorgeously, but let me like say two more things that this running is doing for you that are just so um, good to know. One is it's helping you sleep better at night. That when people exercise during the day, they fall asleep faster and they sleep more soundly. And so we don't often think about exercise actually being something that is improving sleep. And so we're getting the double benefit of both the exercise and the improved sleep as a result. So there's that. Do you find that, Margo, that it helps you, like you're sleeping well? Really? Wow. I never realized that correlation. I, I go to sleep at like 9.30 and everyone's so, everyone's like, everyone gives me like stuff about it. Then I go to bed at 9.30, but I really enjoy going to bed at 9.30. So. Really <laughs> Teenagers need nine hours of sleep a night. Sleep glue that holds human beings together. Okay, but what you described, Margo, I never realized that correlation at all. Like, at no, all. but it's really powerful. So, like, you're getting this double bump from the exercise. Here's the other thing you're doing. And if you're not a runner, but you want the benefit that Margo was describing of the mind clearing aspects, okay, this is something I learned in the pandemic, and it actually has changed choices I make in my own life. So, psychologists talk about two kinds of fascinations. So hard fascination is when we do things really, really interesting and they basically absorb our mind, right? They're, they fill up all the bandwidth. So it might be like playing a game or a video game or losing yourself in a novel or something where it just like, that's your whole mental world. That can be great. That distraction can be valuable. Solid, you and me, that's how we're able to, able to fall asleep at night is the, you know, getting lost in another world. But then there's soft fascination, which is if this is our mental bandwidth, we do things that actually only take up some of it. You don't have to concentrate that hard, like going for a run in nature. Like you don't have to think too much about that. And what it does is it leaves all of this open bandwidth, especially if you don't listen to music, you're not listening to a podcast, you're just alone with your thoughts. And when we do soft fascination activities, all of that available bandwidth starts to go down into our mind and find the loose threads, the things that you were worrying about, the things you almost forgot and that were kind of nagging, you remember them. 
Um, for me, I'm like, oh, I know what I need to say in that email, or I know what my next column is going to be about. But it's where we get creative. It's where we can actually solve all sorts of problems that we're not even trying to solve. Um, and I call it like closing tabs in our mental browsers, right? With all of that place. So um, other common soft fascination activities, taking a shower, right? Like, you know how to take a shower. Like it only takes up this much energy. And if you don't have any music going, don't listen to anything when you're in the shower. Luckily your tech doesn't go in the shower with you. You know how you have your best ideas in the shower? This is why. So um, going for a walk in nature, looking out a window, washing dishes, you know, working in the yard. If you do those things without filling your mind with other input, you will feel your mind become less cluttered because all of that extra bandwidth goes to work and starts solving problems for you and clearing your mind out. So build soft fascination into your routines if you want to continue to drop this waterline. So I'm curious. Do, yeah, do you have a do you have a soft fascination activity? Do you have anything like that? Oh, I'm trying to think. I mean, the the best thoughts in the shower thing is really true yeah. for me too. But uh, one thing I was curious about with the sleep piece is that, like, I don't know, I, especially at the beginning of COVID, but even now, like, I was up until like like two, three in the morning. Like, it's just so hard to like get yourself to like get to sleep. Like, mm -hmm. like, uh, like, how how do you you know sleep? Like, and it, it, you know, I realize always the day after I don't sleep a lot. Like, oh, you know, I should have slept more. But like, how do you do that? I will say this has been a really interesting challenge in the pandemic, being able to fall asleep and stay asleep. And people of all ages have struggled with this. And we don't have the workloads you do that keep us up late at night. And we're not required to be on technology often until late at night like you are. Um, but it's really worth it to get serious about protecting sleep and really worth it to get serious about trying to be going to bed at a reasonable hour. Like basically like everybody should be like Margo on this. Like if you can get your bed to, stuff to bed at nine, 9.30, like you'll be amazed how much better you'll feel. It took a long time for me to get there. I, this just started last year. So <laughs> this was not like it is. Stick with it. Cause the other thing Margo, I, I, I'm actually very, very protective of my sleep and I'm militant about sleeping a lot because I actually work so much better and faster. I get more done because I'm well rested than I would get done if I stayed up and worked. But to get there, here's what you need to do. Treat sleep, not like a switch you flip, right? Not the like, okay, I'm awake and now it's time for bed. I'm gonna try to go sleep. Treat sleep like a destination that you will arrive at after you put yourself on a path to that destination. So, so let's say we're gonna reform you and you're gonna start going to bed at 10 or 10.30, okay? So what you need to do, let's say it's 10 o'clock bedtime for you, which I know is probably ambitiously early, but we'll go with it. By nine or 9.30, you need to be on the path to sleep. You need to be doing whatever your nighttime, you know, routine is with your washing your face, brushing your teeth. You need to be getting into your pajamas. You need to be getting your book. You need to be getting into bed. You need to be turning on the lights. You don't want technology on your path because that always stirs things up and makes it harder to fall asleep. If you develop a nightly routine where you do the same things in that order every night down that path, your body will be like, oh, I know what's happening here. This is what we always do right before bed. And it will help you to actually move into sleep mode. But if you're working or running around and then trying to go to sleep right away, it will not work. What else you got for me? Oh, um, the next one. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. Um, you know, while we're we're on this path of of you know recognizing um, yourself and your mental health and trying to do you know more for yourself, um, when you're when you're like at the point of asking for help, um, how do you? you know, how do you navigate around if there's like culture or religious or community stigma, like if your family is really, you know, if your parents are not as supportive about mental health care or where, how do you sort of navigate that, that field? Mm -hmm. That's really hard. And I know that that happens where there are communities or cultures where seeking help around mental health questions is not necessarily um, considered something that's done or is seen as taboo. And that can be really challenging for a young person who feels like they need help and yet isn't quite sure they can ask their family. 
So there are a couple of ways to, um, to approach that. One is, I hope all of you have good counselors at school who you can access. And, and it's often the case that the counselors at school, you can just walk on in, right? That you can just refer yourself. And it's almost always the case that that can be a private conversation unless there's something really dangerous going on. So the first thing I would say is use your resources that you have that are the low hanging fruit of good support. Um, and you may or may not need to loop your parents into the process and get the support you need and just skip that step around having to have a conversation that you're worried isn't gonna go well. Um, what I would say is if you know already that checking in with a school counselor isn't gonna really cut it, that, that what you deserve and need is more support than that, um, then I think that you might approach your parents and say, um, we want the same thing, which is that we want for me to be thriving and I've gotten stuck. I'm, I'm having a hard time getting unstuck. And I think it would really help if I had a neutral third party I could talk to. Um, so I would, I would just lay it out in that way, which is that, you know, everybody wants to see young people thrive and, and um, you know, see how it goes over. And another option is to actually seek consultation with the school counselor about approaching one's parents. Um, to say, look, I know I need psychotherapy. I'm not sure my parents are gonna be on board with this. Got any guidance for me, got any help for how we might um, put this forward as an idea. But I would say, don't feel like you gotta go it alone. Um, there are grownups who can help um, and maybe help you have that conversation with your families. I wonder, I'm curious about, uh, you mentioned like, like needing psychotherapy or whatever, and my mom's a therapist and I still don't like feel like I really know like what therapy is like, and you know, loads of, uh, I think that a lot of people I age also don't really like have a great idea of like what exactly it really is. Like what, what is therapy? Great question. I don't know that I know what therapy is. No, so, um, so what psychotherapy is, is it's a place where clinicians help people get to know themselves better and understand their own operating systems a little bit better and um, maybe get some insight into themselves, understand why they're doing what they're doing. And then once that understanding is available, people have more choice. So I'll give um, an example, a very kind of ominous example. So say a young person is self-harming as a, as a way to manage their distress, right? So that they are maybe cutting themselves or doing something like that where they're not taking good care of themselves. Okay, so what could psychotherapy do for them? In psychotherapy, they would have a place to talk with someone who really without judgment is curious about why this is happening, right? Isn't gonna just go from the standpoint of like, ah, stop. Like, tell me why this is happening. We'll really try to get to the bottom of what are the feelings that are making this happen? And then say, okay, you're trying to cope with these feelings. You're coping with them in a way where you're getting hurt. What other forms of coping might help you? Both, you know, we'll try to stem the feelings and not have you feel this bad. And we'll also work on the other part of this, which is how you're coping with them effectively. But when we know why we feel so bad and when we have someone who thinks with us about it, options suddenly present themselves. So psychotherapy is for when you feel like you've hit a dead end and good psychotherapy helps you find roads that get you out. And having someone who's trained in finding the roads, that's what psychotherapy is. I, I wanted to I, um, kind of when or like who should go to therapy? Should everyone go find a therapist? <laughs> like. And if that's like not like a financial option for some people, what, yeah. um, what sort of, um, what else should they do to like go find someone to talk through the problem? Cause I know sometimes with friends, it's really hard to like have courage to like go and just vent Cause it's, you know, you feel bad for your friend. Cause like, you don't want them, you don't want to just dump on your friend. So I know that's really hard. So yeah. what, what are the options here? Um, <laughs> Well, so the question, should everybody have psychotherapy? I will tell you honestly, in the pandemic, I'm like, all teenagers deserve psychotherapy. Like just a blanket. Like I've never felt that way before in my career, but I'm like, therapy for everyone. You get a therapist, you get a therapist. Everyone gets a therapist. Like, and of course I know that's not been available to young people everywhere, but 
what we have asked of you in this pandemic, the conditions under which you have been operating are horrible. And you have been incredible through this. But thinking about psychotherapy as just support, like when, when somebody's in a really, really rough situation and just deserves support, every teenager needed and deserved psychotherapy just for the support side of it in this. Okay, but not everybody has easy access to that. Okay, so what do we do? Friends can be great. Um, Grownups who are good listeners can be great. And sometimes that's a counselor at school. Sometimes it's just a really good teacher. Like, you know which teachers you could just go talk to and who would just listen. Sometimes your parents can be great. Um, either they are great listeners or you can say to them, here's what I need. I just need you to listen. I just need you to listen. No guidance, no advice, no input, no feedback. I just need you to listen. And I have to tell you, Psychotherapy is more complicated than people just listening without judgment. But I will say probably 85 to 90% of the good work we do is listening without judgment. So um, since we can't have psychotherapy for everybody as much as I would like it, if you can find someone who can listen without judgment or you can instruct somebody to listen without judgment, it can go pretty far. And lots of empathy. I'm curious, what do you do about, well, like you mentioned, like having, you know, the, the, you know, the great adults in your life, who you know, like you feel like you can share with or whatever, but like, well, what do you do if you have like uh, uh, teachers who don't really like get it? Like, this is kind of a problem. I feel like, you know, I've had my friends I've had where you try and go to your teacher and you say, you know, I've had a hard, I'm having a tough time or whatever, you know, can, you know, cut, can you cut me some slack or sometimes and, or, or something and sometimes it can be hard. Like, what do you do if you have a teacher who doesn't really get it? Um, kind of got to work with that teacher. That's a problem, right? I mean, that, that that's, you know, they have a lot of power. So um, the question for me then becomes, is there one grown up somewhere who gets it? Because there, you know, not every grown up's going to get it. So is there some teacher? And what's often interesting to me as I watch young people go through school is um, they may go back, you know, so if they're in like 10th or 11th grade, they may actually maintain a good working relationship with the teacher they had in the ninth grade and swing by that teacher's office and talk and share and check in. And so it doesn't have the, um, the kind of dual relationship of both seeking like emotional support and also getting graded by the person, like that part of the relationship is over. And so my question would be, and this feels to me critically important, does, does every young person have a grown up in their corner? Does every young person have a grown up they feel they can talk openly to and trust? If the answer to that is yes, I feel a lot more comfortable. If there's a no on that, I feel really uncomfortable. But who that grown up is, I mean, it can be a coach. It can be, um, you know, there, there's this, I consulted a school where there's somebody who works at the front desk and I know that there are several students at the school where that front desk person was their person. I think that's wonderful. Um, I remember in the, one of our, in one of our first questions, you touched on, um, students that take their emotions and then put it towards like a negative behavior such as drinking or um, getting high and things like that. Um, and I think it happens a lot more than we realize. Um, and how do you sort of, if, if you're, how do you sort of go about um, helping that person out or, or you know, talking to them um, and then, yeah, yeah, helping them out and helping them through. Yeah. With their, their no, I, I think that's true. Um, and, and the problem with drinking and getting high when you're upset is that it works, right? If you felt really upset before you were drunk or high and then you get drunk or high, you actually feel a lot better. And, and so in the short term, it's effective coping, right? The feeling goes away. Um, okay, but here's how you talk to somebody about that. Is you say, look, I get it. I see that it's working. Like when you get high, you feel a lot better. Two problems with this. First of all, if that becomes the habit for how you manage distress, and if we have 14 solid months of distress, which we've had, you're setting yourself up for some pretty serious long-term problems, right? If you're getting high a lot, if you're drinking a lot, that never goes well. 
right? Things start to fall apart, right? Safety is a concern, but there's also like, you're not doing well in school anymore. You're not doing well in your relationships. Like things start to fall apart. So that's the first problem. Here's the second problem. And this um, to me is fascinating. So I, um, I remember in my training when we got talking about um, substance abuse, somebody said, well, here's how it works with substance abuse. And they laid out this very simple rule. And when they laid it out, I thought that feels too simple to be true. They said, people stop maturing at the age at which they develop a substance misuse problem or a substance abuse problem. So if you're 16 and you strike on the truth that getting high makes pain, makes your pain go away and you develop a substance abuse problem at 16 and that becomes how pain gets managed after that time, it doesn't matter if you're 30, you're still emotionally 16. And here's how. Pain actually brings maturation. You know how when you have a really hard day and you're really upset and then you talk to somebody about it and that relationship deepens and you get to know yourself, that's growth. Or you know how you make a dumb mistake sometimes or maybe not dumb mistake and it like really, really bothers you and it makes you really uncomfortable and you sit in that discomfort and you don't make the same mistake again, that's maturation. If every time you feel crummy, you just numb it out, you don't grow as a function of that discomfort. So for me, like if there's any reason why you do not want to start to use substances as a way to manage distress is you get stuck developmentally. And so you may look like a grown up, you may you know, drive a car and have a checkbook, you're still a kid. And, and, and maturation comes when you guys go through hard things, which also means you're gonna get some payoff through, from this hard year you've been through. You guys have grown so much in having to manage this. And so much of what life throws at you after this is gonna feel like small potatoes because of such a painful growing year for you. That's really, really interesting. I wonder that like, it's, it's just so difficult, you know, if you have a friend who, you know, cause you feel kind of out of your depth, but at the same time, you don't really want to like bring an adult and be like that person, you know, like, like, what do you do? So like you have a friend who's like smoking tons of weed. Yeah. And you're worried about them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one question is, is the rubber starting to hit the road? Meaning they're smoking tons of weed and they're not turning in their work or they're smoking tons of weed and they're starting to become not that good a friend and nobody wants to hang out with them anymore like you know is there starting to be some material impact and if there's starting to be some material impact you can be like I love you I care about you and I don't know if you're connecting the dots but I think you know all this complaint you have about the teachers being on your case may be connected to the fact that you're like high a lot right so you might just say like you've got these complaints about things that aren't working for you you may have more power in this than you think um I think that's probably how I'd go about it, um, is to show them where it's starting to get in their way and to show them big picture where it's starting to get in their way. Because if you start using on a pretty regular basis, things start to fall apart. You guys are such good friends I, I, to people. I mean, I, I did, this is what I adore about teenagers is how how much you tend to one another and how much you want to do right by each other. That might be a good transition since we're getting towards the end of our time and not everyone on this call like is a teenager. And so we're, we're wondering also about like uh, for, for the adults here, how can they like support, you know, kids that they care about, you know, whether they're especially like, in the pandemic too. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I would say is don't, um, don't begrudge them their distress. I think it is enormously difficult to be a teenager in the pandemic. Um, I think, you know, by and large, I would say it's harder to be a teenager than to be an adult. And, and I, I'll tell you why. I mean, I think, you know, in middle age, like whatever I don't do this year, I can just do next year, you know, but for teenagers, you're losing things that are one-time deals for your whole life and that you've been losing those for 14 months. And, and I think that's a really meaningful and big thing. Um, for teenagers, you got two jobs, to become more independent and hang out with your friends. 
the two jobs of being a teenager have actually been totally disrupted by the pandemic. So what I would say to the adults is your empathy should be bottomless here. And teenagers can summon energy, they can write themselves, but the thing that helps them get there faster is if they actually feel heard and if they feel like grownups are actually paying attention to how painful this is and saying to them, I hear you and I cannot believe you've had to go through this and I am so sorry this landed on you at this time in your life. That's therapeutic. That tends to help young people be able to reconcile what they've been through and get ready to move on. Fighting them about the fact that they're upset is not helpful. They have every right to be upset. Does that feel right to you, Saul or Margo? Saul, do you wanna go ahead? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, I think, I think so. Like. Yeah, it, it does feel good when you know you feel like you're being genuinely listened to like by adults. I, I know sometimes it can be hard because it sort of feels like, you know, sometimes adults can, you know, sort of be listening, but not really. And, it, you know, it's hard to tell like kind of the line between being talked down to and kind of really being genuinely listened to. It's kind of like a hard balance to strike because I kind of want to get treated like an adult, but also like, I'm, you know, not. And so, <laughs> you know. I know exactly how you feel. Like, oh, treat me, you know, I'm an independent, you know, mm -hmm. woman, but oh, like, Caress me and like <laughs> be supportive of me. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have to meet you where you are. When you want you want um our support for your independence, we gotta be there. And when you need to cuddle, you gotta be there. Um, this has been a fabulous conversation, Margo and Saul. I, I don't know if you've been even glancing at the Q&A, but people are saying such nice things about both of you. And I'm sure it's not just your um, aunt and uncle and godparents. So, uh, <laughs> though it might be. Um, great conversation, great preparation. Really appreciate um, the vitality that you've brought. And obviously, lots of hours of thoughtful preparation. It's been a pleasure from the fan perspective, been a pleasure collaborating with the two of you and the other members of the Mental Health Working Group with the Mayor's Youth Commission. It's been just a pleasure from start to finish, and I hope we can do it again uh, next next school, next school season. So a couple quick notes for everybody. After hours, this is a special after hours. For those of you who've been to fan events, you know that we do these after hours when authors are on book tours and you buy a copy of the book and you can get into uh, the after hours and come with uh, cameras on. You get to ask your own questions and, and chat is two way, it's very interactive. For this event, uh, it was very important to both Saul and Margo to make sure that after hours, there was no book by anybody can come to after hours. It's a great idea. So you see the link in there in chat. If you don't have chat open, I hope you do have chat open. We've been posting in the link. Come to after hours. You can pose questions to Lisa. Um, we'll be opening it up. We'll have a five minute bio break. We'll be opening up after hours at about 8.05. So come join us. I'm gonna jump into just a couple questions here, Lisa. Um, there's, you know, just so that folks understand a little bit the framing here, there were about 30 questions submitted ahead of time. Tonight, there's another 18 questions submitted. So I think as is clear to everyone, we're not going to get to everybody's questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to go with some votes here. Uh, ben has asked a question that's gotten five upvotes. So we're going to start with Ben's question. Uh, he asks, what's your advice for parents when advocating with teachers and school administrators regarding poor academic performance this past year due to COVID and compromised mental health. Many school counselors are telling parents their children need to do summer school. Mm -hmm. Our young people have already been run through the gauntlet. More school in the summer is not an appropriate answer. So Lisa, I know you also work with schools. What's your perspective on this? Um, okay, so there's two ways to slice this. The first is you are totally right. Kids are exhausted, they need a break. Um, and I do think kids will be more resilient after this pandemic, but the way you get strength is first you work out and then you rest and then the strength comes. All right, you guys just had the psychological workout of your lifetimes, you need to rest. And if you can rest, I don't doubt that everyone will come back to the school year stronger in the fall. So that's one side of it. Now, there's plenty of time in the summer. And so it may be possible to both get some rest and maybe do a little catch up. So then the question is, if kids are doing schoolwork during the summer, why are they doing it? Are they doing it because people are anxious and just feel like you should throw some schoolwork down just to like patch up some you know vague concern about what was lost this year? Or did they really miss mastery on something where if they don't get that mastery, they're really up a creek in the fall? 
that's the only time I would say, okay, you know, like you can have one bad year, but you don't want that one bad year to turn into two bad years. So that's a time where maybe a little bit of patch patch in the summer is fine. But then I would say it has to be a little bit of work to do the patching and then rest, just hanging out, just doing whatever feels restorative to that young person because you don't want, I mean, they have no gas in their tanks right now. Them starting the school year with an empty tank is not going to set them up well. I hear you on that. Okay, we're going to go to Abby's question. I think we probably have time. We're at 7.57. We have time for Abby's question as well. Uh, first, it starts with a compliment. Margo and Saul, you two are so impressive and sophisticated. Wonderful job tonight. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and then, of course, they thank Lisa for insight. Then she says, oh, were there a few aspects of pre-pandemic teen life that you would like to see go away or remain modified post-pandemic? And Margo and Saul, maybe you guys might have a thought about that. Was there something that was about your life before the pandemic that you're like, you know, I don't need to bring that back. I'm okay if that doesn't come back, that part. And, and if so, I'm curious what the answers might be. Um, I, for me, you know what, I, you know what, it was, schools are were really germy. <laughs> um, uh, I just give that, um, yeah, schools were a little germy and like, <laughs> there's a lot of like, unsanitary stuff going on. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So you like, you like it a little bit cleaner. I could appreciate that. Saul, what about oh, yeah. you? For me, I think honestly, Zoom school, it was so nice being able to wake up like 10 minutes before class starts and just get like that extra hour. And like, it feels like school starting a little bit later, like as a result, like, like I'd like it if school started a little bit later for me. Yeah, I appreciate that. Lisa, thoughts? Well, actually what I am interested in, and I've heard from a lot of teenagers is sometimes like the evening meetings that they used to go be with their peers, if those could stay on Zoom, right? So let's like, I think we should go back to regular school but if there are things where you're then traveling, trying to get together, and it means you're getting home late and missing sleep, that kind of stuff, some of the after school stuff, I think if it could stay on Zoom, would make your lives a lot easier. Lisa, there's one last question because I think we have time for you to maybe comment on this one thing from Karen. Um, she says, unfortunately, many teens haven't had access to other adults like teachers and coaches in the pandemic. That's one of the things that may, that it's not actually a question, but I think it's something if you could address. That is one of the things that has made this time so unique and hard. So it's not really like you're walking around the building and just pop into the counselor's office and pop back out. And maybe kids don't feel like they necessarily know their teacher as much on a Zoom screen as they might if it were in-person classes. What are your thoughts? This is my number one worry about the pandemic is that um, I feel like the gap between adults and adolescents has really grown. and I think um, I worry a lot that there are kids who are suffering who we are not um, in good contact with. And so what I would say to parents is, if you are worried about your kid, come out, call the school, get in contact with grownups and get support. I would say to teenagers, if you are worried about a friend, do not sit on that information. Tell your folks, reach out to their folks. I mean, that this is the all time it takes a village moment and um, kids don't have the casual contact with adults that is part of what keeps them healthy and safe. So anyone who's in contact with the team that they're worried about needs to send up a flag if there's a concern. Thank you, Lisa. Lots more questions. Join us for After Hours. It's free and open to the public. Just click on the link. Come join us. Uh, Saul, were you going to say something? Looks like you have your hand oh. up. Can we just say an enormous thank you to Dr. DeMore on behalf of the, especially on behalf of the Youth Commission. Like it's been just so, so wonderful for you to have this like really lovely conversation, all your like lessons and everything. I'm and Lonnie, to you too. We, we really enjoyed collaborating with you and uh, thank you again to, to Lisa and, and everything that, that everyone that helped make this happen. This mm -hmm. is a really great conversation. Same, same. Thanks to all of you for this night. This was really special really um, it's our pleasure to be of service so with that we hope to see folks next week to learn about hunt and gather parent with Micheline Duclef that's going to be a fabulous event as well and hope to see you these folks are going to get about a five minute bio break here we'll let everybody in once they're in the green room so hope to see you soon thanks everybody for tuning in and best wishes Thank you.